Okay. So hello everyone. I would like to introduce first uh, Teturo, dubbed the voice of our Asian generation by Rice Paper Magazine. Teturo's theatrical solo work, Empire of the Sun, was named the best show of 2015 by the Vancouver Sun and has been touring continuously throughout Canada and beyond. His other solo work, One Hour Photo, garnered five Jesse nominations, winning for significant artistic achievement and was named as a finalist for the 2019 Governor General's Award for Drama and is currently touring virtually. And I was lucky to see it, so I would highly recommend everyone to get a ticket and see it. Oh, Amazing. thanks, Tal. <laughs> um, our second uh, speaker today is going to be Rezgar, Rezgar Hama, originally from South Kurdistan, Vancouver-based playwright, theater director, actor, acting coach, and writer, Rizgar Hammer, uh, currently serve, serves as an artistic director for Sky Theater Group. And our last but not least, Scott, Scott Button is a creator working in film, television, and theater. He's an inaugural member of the Arts Club Emerging Playwrights Unit, a graduate of UBC, yay, a Jesse nominated actor, and an award-winning playwright. He is grateful to reside on unceded Coast Salish territory with his spouse, Chris. If you want to hear more about him, go to www.scottbutton.ca. And I'm um, Tatsuro, please take it away and we will continue with Rasgar after you and then Scott. All right. Uh, and by take it away, uh, is, does that mean, <laughs> help me out here a little bit. Uh, what, uh, what, what, sh what should I be doing now? Is that uh, sh showing a clip of my work? Sure, you, uh, okay. we, uh, we, we ask you to show us a little bit clip of your work and tell us a little bit about the transition process from live theater into um, the Zoom world. The oh, virtual. terrific, yes, of course. Thanks for the reminder. Mm -hmm. um, Chris, so, uh, should we begin with a clip or should I just begin? Uh, okay, uh, so this is a little clip from the cinematic adaptation of One Hour Photo, which originally began uh, as a stage show back in 2017. Um, but uh, in December of last year, we uh, got some funds together in order to take our planned um, physical tour. Uh, and when that was no longer possible, we uh, created this cinematic adaptation instead. So uh, here is a, a brief clip from One Hour Photo. This is not an aquarium. This is a box of mirrors, a box of two-way mirrors. When I was a kid, we used to have this three-paneled mirror in the bathroom. I'd climb up onto the sink and kneel before it. I was fascinated by this endless tunnel of reflections that began to curve into view. And just as I thought, I might glimpse eternity, my big fat head got in the way. <laughs> a bunk bed is a wonderful thing. The cave-like coziness of the bottom bunk is a magic carpet ride of the top bunk. Unless, of course, you're an adult. If you're a man or a woman and you find yourself weighing the pros and cons of top bunk versus bottom bunk, that's a pretty good indication something's gone horribly wrong with your life. After Pearl Harbor, thousands of Japanese Canadians had their homes seized by the government. They had just 24 hours to pack up what they could carry. And then they found themselves being corralled through the grounds of Vancouver's County Fair, the p e at Hastings Park. This is the PE Forum. Maybe you've enjoyed a concert here. It was designated as the men's dormitory. Police were stationed at the entrances to guard against wives and girlfriends from entering the space to prevent, and I quote, further propagation of the species. 
Women and children were housed in the livestock building where they had all the creature comforts of farm animals. I used to think about what is the difference between dying and living? Obviously we know when a person is no longer living, but you know, the hair grows. The cells in your body will continue going until it eventually runs out of energy and when all the biochemical <laughs> reactions reach equilibrium, nothing else happening, is that person uh, dead? I think there's a physics term called entropy, point where there's no more reaction of any kind, the sum of all activities zero. Houses are such curious things, aren't they? I mean, what other form of architecture is so laden with personal meaning? When we drive past our childhood home, we don't just see a building. It is a vessel of memories. Now, my little family, we've always lived in super small spaces, basement suites, graduate housing. So when we first moved in, my kids were super excited by all the space. They ran from room to room, staking out their claims like little imperialists. When we move into a new home, we see nothing but possibilities. Blank pages upon which we get to write our own stories. But how often do we stop and think, who lived here before? What was their story? Why did they leave? Was it because they wanted to or because they had to? Were they displaced by forces beyond their own control? And to this day, do they still drive by, slow down before moving on? Sociologists have noted that certain immigrant groups, despite having achieved economic stability, continue to rent even though they can afford a mortgage. My father-in-law refused to sell his property in Iran. He used to fret, but what if the Canadian government takes our house away? Where will we go? His children would laugh at him, Baba, this is Canada. That kind of thing does not happen here. After Pearl Harbor, the Canadian government executed a to-do list against its own citizens that would have made Vladimir Putin proud. Shut down community newspapers. Every person of the Japanese race shall hereafter be at his usual place of residence each day before sunset and shall remain therein until sunrise on the following day. No person of the Japanese race shall have in his possession or in any motor vehicle a radio transmitter, a radio receiving set, or a camera. All Japanese mail and correspondence shall be censored. All fishermen of the Japanese race shall hand over their fishing craft to the custodian of enemy alien property. I became a father on August 12, 2003. As a new parent, you can't help but remember dates like that because there are so many forms to fill out. Three years later, 2006, my little family were camping in the mountains in Santa Barbara near this lake. It was the middle of the night when my three-year-old daughter wakes up and says, I'm cold, mommy. Without even opening her eyes, my wife sweeps our daughter into her own sleeping bag. I rolled over and nestled closer to them, not for them, but for me. For some reason, those three words, I'm cold, mommy, really frightened me. It was so cold. She's so small. You never want your kid to be that cold. Just after we were uh, taken off the train in Slocan City, uh, because many of the <clears throat> shacks were not built. They weren't ready, so they put us in tents. And uh, it got cold enough at times. Uh, the, in, the water in pails that were kept in the, uh, inside the, the uh, units could be frozen. 
my youngest brother, Tats, who was about maybe two years old or two and a half years old, he was coughing, whooping, you know. I, I don't know, I guess, I guess it goes like, you know, and then coughing in this tent. And that is one time when I was angry at the government, yeah, because I thought Tats, the youngest one, was going to uh, die there, you know. Yeah, that's when I was really, uh, really felt very hostile <laughs> for the situation we're in. Now, what you're about to see marks the first time unauthorized footage of the incarceration has ever been screened publicly. You're amongst the very first people to ever see this. Now, what's amazing about this footage is that it isn't from the Canadian government's perspective, who referred to the Nikkei as evacuees, implying that they were in need of being rescued from their middle-class lives. This is Lemon Creek, a former cow pasture. Now, in order to control the narrative, the Canadian government seized all personal cameras, even children's toy cameras were taken away. There's a man's shadow coming up at the bottom of the screen. Stop. I don't know anything about him beyond the fact that he is reckless. I mean, pulling the trigger on an eight millimeter movie camera in the middle of an incarceration camp? Why don't you go ahead and aim a starting pistol at a Mountie while you're at it? So reckless. So what did this Nikkei so badly wish to document? He was willing to break the law? Well, whether it's in the big city or the middle of nowhere, weddings. Weddings are exciting. Now, something tells me getting married wasn't his idea. Shotgun wedding, maybe? Look how well-dressed these Nikkei are. These are my people. Now, I don't know where this honeymoon getaway car thinks it's going the other side of camp, maybe? <laughs> Hopefully, these newlyweds were able to fulfill other nuptial traditions. Future sumo wrestler, right there. Yokozuna! I wonder if any of you remember your childhood address. Mine right. is. I think uh, maybe one, we'll, nine, six, we'll pause it there. <laughs> For my kids, it'll be. Six, uh, six, thanks, five. thanks very much. Uh, so that was a, a clip uh, from the cinematic version of One Hour Photo, and um, as you could probably surmise, that was an exploration of the incarceration of Japanese Canadians uh, just after Pearl Harbor during World War II. And it's funny, as I watch that clip, uh, I'm reminded of the, uh, it really strikes me, the, the absence of, of the audience. And I'm not quite sure, I wonder how that, that is for viewers. I know for people who've written me, having watched the virtual version, they said they quite enjoyed the intimacy um, of being able to sit in their darkened living room and to be able to watch the performance as if I were performing solely for them. And I suppose that is a positive thing, but I, I half wonder if that might be a kind of, um, I don't know, a minority opinion, because to me, it, it strikes me as a little, uh, as a little odd um, and certainly uh, contrasts with the experience of performing for a live audience. I suppose a question I often get during, um, after every performance, because uh, right now it's on a virtual tour. We've done four Canadian cities and right now it's playing out of Los Angeles East West players. And if anyone is interested in uh, watching that, I wouldn't be a, I think a true theater artist if I didn't plug a little bit. So I'm gonna just put that link uh, in the chat if anyone wants to check that out. But um, this weekend and next weekend, you'll be playing in the Pacific time zone at East West players. And I've just put in a link there if you want to check that out. And after every performance, we have a live Q&A. Now, as you know, within a face-to-face -face theater run, you might get two or three 
talkbacks uh, in the course of a run. So this is one of the affordances of Zoom theater that I really enjoy because after every performance, I'm able to tune in and uh, be, to give an actual performance. A question I often get uh, during the talkbacks is what is the difference between doing a live show versus uh, the version you just saw? And I suppose for me, the biggest challenge was uh, as a performer, uh, so many, I'm, on, I'm not like uh, other talented actors, for example, like Scott Button, fellow playwright actor. He, uh, Scott does television, he does movies, he does commercials, he, he does it all. But I only ever do theater. So for me to be in the culture's historic theater performing to no one really, I mean, there was the film crew there, but they were not paying attention to me. They were all busy trying to do their own jobs the best they could, uh, you know, focusing the lights, um, pulling, you know, handling the lenses, what have you. And the theater folks that were there were all the designers and they were solely focused on translating their particular contribution into cinematic terms. And so no one was paying attention to me. And so I realized, oh, this is just the rehearsal. And so I asked my producer, Donna, Donna Yamamoto, who was the, the daughter of, of the man you just heard mass. I said, Donna, let me have one person in the audience or in, in the house who hasn't yet to see the, who has yet to see the show because otherwise i'm just going through the motions and donna said absolutely not covid restrictions we can't take that risk yeah allison that's that was my reaction i was i couldn't believe it and i said donna this is going to be the definitive version of of this show if you want something worth recording give me that one person in the balcony they'll be by themselves and donna said to me tetsuro tell you what why don't you imagine someone sitting in the balcony? It's called acting. Maybe you should try it sometime. But Donna being the very kind person that she is, she relented. She actually opted to stay out of the theater. Um, and I was able to have one person who had wanted to see one hour photo, but was unable to. And so for me, just having that one person who had yet to hear the story really, and y'all are familiar with this experience of having the words lift off the page and suddenly you're speaking to someone. And so for me, that was such an important element because those cameras, this, this play was adapted by a production company called Bright House Pictures and it, they do Netflix and feature films. And so the cameras they bring in, you know, this is the kind of camera that I'm used to working with, right? And so not very intimidating, a, a GoPro that sits in, the palm of your hands, but these cameras were larger than Harley Davidson motorcycles and their lenses were like the size of dinner plates. And so for me, it was very intimidating to be able to, to be confronted and or to be immersed in the apparatus of this gigantic machine. And so just knowing that one person was there made all the difference in the world. I think something that audiences often underestimate is how much of a duet it is in live theater in particular uh, in terms of for me it's, it's just the dialogue even though it's a solo work for me it's always a dance between two people whether that's one person in the audience has a particular quality of attention or you know, several hundred people i can't do what i do without that audience and so for me that was um, i think the the biggest epiphany i had and now of course that we're doing different types of performance in Zoom, whenever I present or perform, I always ask not to be in the webinar format, but to be like this. So I can see uh, folks' reaction. Like for example, Allison, you know, you have a very expressive theater face. And so th that of course feeds into, and that becomes a kind of um, energetic loop, which for me remains uh, such an important part of theater, whether it's face-to-face -face or here in this particular space. Anyway, I've been talking way too long. <laughs> Thanks very much. Thank you, Tutor. Rosgar, do you want to take it, continue and describe a little bit about your project and the transition to online? And you're muted. Uh, hi, everyone. <clears throat> well, uh, thank you, Tutor. That was great. Uh, I saw this uh, one hour photo. And I think it's very creative, especially the virtual 
version of it. Thank you. Uh, I'm really delighted to be here today. Uh, and uh, I would like to start by thanking George for introducing me to this uh, RBT and uh, having this opportunity to talk about my project, My Home is a Suitcase. Uh, my Home is a Suitcase is a research-based theater uh, uh, in collaboration with newcomers uh, from different backgrounds to Canada. Uh, it describes uh, the displacement of over 65 million people uh, around the world. Uh, the story of uh, illegal refugees is connected directly to the savage uh, smugglers. It's the story of uh, the victims of sexual assault, slavery, terror, and violence. Before I describe the details of uh, this project uh, and how I decided to create my home is a suitcase, uh, I would like to make my personal uh, life, my personal story, and uh, introduction. So that maybe makes it clear to everyone why I chose this uh, this project, this subject. Uh, I've been displaced so many times in my life. Questioning home is uh, always been a major concern of for me especially being born and raised in a country that's been occupied and divided between Iraq, Iran, Turkey, and Syria, uh, that would make me feel like I was born as a refugee in my own country. Then questioning home uh, become like an existential question for me. Not to mention that uh, I have also faced displacement many times in my life. For example, 1975, after the agreement between Iraq and Iran, my family and uh, thousands of other people were uh, displaced, had to flee their homes and uh, uh, go to Iran. Uh, by the time that uh, Iraqi uh, regime has destroyed thousands of villages and cities. Uh, I witnessed that. From 1983 to 1988, uh, the same regime has uh, started a, a genocide process that's called Anfal, uh, a rule from Quran, uh, which allows the Muslims to, to kill everyone and permits men to have sexual access to uh, uh, the females uh, or some slaves. Uh, during the time of between 1983 to 88, that regime killed nearly 182 uh, civilians, children, men and women. Uh, and that was uh, uh, for the, I, I say for the major crime of them, which has been a uh, court. Uh, also in 1988, uh, most of you heard about it after, after a few years, because during the time, uh, none of uh, Eastern, Western, Northern, any media were talking about this uh, crimes by this regime. Uh, in 1988, uh, they used chemical gas against uh, civilians and killed uh, nearly 5,000 people, including my uh, my cousins. And the rest of the people had to flee again to Iran. Uh, 1991, uh, the, that regime attacked the cities and villages uh, and uh, we had to flee again to Iran. 1996, another attack, uh, a big attack uh, with the Iraqi army. And uh, we fled again to Iran. Uh, 
As I say Iran, I mean the Eastern Kurdistan that is occupied by Iran. Uh, we, we call it Eastern Kurdistan, but uh, most people know it as uh, Kurdistan of Iran. Anyways, I was always carrying uh, the question of uh, home through borders and uh, countries. Uh, in 2016, I went uh, to Kurdistan for a theater project, uh, an enemy of the people uh, absence. Uh, on the way, uh, on my way back, uh, I we gave my brother a visit in Germany, and uh, one day he took me to visit uh, one of his friends who arrived in Germany, and uh, they were living in a camp, a refugee camp, uh, himself with. Uh, uh, his family, his wife and three kids. Uh, by entering this camp, uh, and, uh, before I was watching news, that was the time for the big uh, uh, flow of uh, refugee crisis in uh, Europe, especially. Uh, but by entering this camp, uh, uh, after this is uh, extremely unbelievable, terrible place of these families and individuals. Uh, I have decided to do something about it. Uh, just to make it clear about this refugee, why, why, why uh, uh, I, I got stuck to it is uh, that it, it was a big land, uh, very far from the city, uh, no transportation whatsoever. Uh, fully fenced uh, around and uh, entrance was through a checkpoint. So it's like a, a prison uh, at that time. Uh, on the other hand, this is what I saw in, uh, over there, but uh, uh, when, when I check what happened in Canada, uh, there's nobody out there to help the newcomers, uh, new refugees. Uh, they arrive here uh, after the investigation by the Canada, uh, Canada Border Agency Services. Uh, they let them go, uh, which means they go out to the uh, Georgia Street. I, I talk about Vancouver. Uh, uh, and. Uh, this is their first day in Vancouver. Uh, most of them, they don't know any English. Uh, they don't know anybody here. And they are not familiar with this uh, new city. <laughs> Imagine yourself to be in a city and you have no idea about anything, any street or any, anywhere. So they, they, what, what happens, they, I, I, I know a few cases that they slept on the street for a few days, a few nights. Uh, and there are nobody to help. Uh, I can say th since 2014, I have witnessed uh, uh, many refugees who come to Vancouver. There was nobody to shelter them. Uh, and uh, sometimes they, they were going to, the, you know, there's a, a couple of shelters in downtown east side, uh, and it's, absolutely not designed for newcomers or refugees. It's uh, mostly it's for addicted people. And uh, people who stayed there because uh, uh, the feeling of being strange, the feeling of being some, some uh, different place, uh, they, they, they were suffering from uh, mental, I, I, I personally, I witnessed many of those those people. I, I, I met them. Uh, this this what uh, what uh, the negative impact on on their uh, mental well being. Uh, oh, well, in in Germany, because of the terrible camps, uh, refugees complain that uh, conditions are affecting their mental health as well. Uh, but, well, the same thing, but those, but those countries who uh, offer the, the camps, but it's, it's not 
a good place to live in and those countries that they don't uh, offer anything uh, beside that uh, uh, in, uh, newcomers uh, not just newcomers actually uh, even the minority group members uh, other ethnic and uh, have been subjected to hate uh, systematic racism uh, and continued uh, discrimination in my research i heard uh, many stories of uh, fundamental antipathy to immigrants I know people who change their names uh, in order to get interview for professional jobs uh, because of their names not familiar. So like my name, uh, they don't get the interview just through the name. Uh, imagine what happens later. Uh, I have decided to do my research for the sake of a theater project uh, to bring the details of this crisis to the audience. To start, I have uh, divided the whole process uh, of producing My Home is a Suitcase into three phases. Uh, the first phase I, is what I call a narrative approach. Uh, the visuals of this approach is, uh, lies in its uh, straightforward description of the paradox of home. Uh, it lies in its uh, concentrate on home and uh, diaspora. Uh, the ultimate intention, uh, intention of this project, uh, uh, of this phase actually, is uh, to humanize and uh, create understanding for those who are perceived as uh, different. Uh, through sharing narratives and telling stories of what life looked like before they decide or be forced to leave their home or, or before they come to Canada. Uh, through this uh, phase, uh, I can say we strive to connect people on deeper uh, level. Storytelling is a natural uh, way to recall an experience and sometimes it's uh, well in our daily life we don't only produce narratives to visualize and structure our life experience but uh, we also do it to recognize narratives from those social world we live in to create a deeper connection with the, our surroundings. With the help of uh, Hila Graf and uh, Lenora Isi, and the hard working of seven participants from different backgrounds, uh, after four months, uh, we had two performances of the first phase of uh, My Home is a Suitcase on December 2019 and uh, January 2020. Uh, first at the Granville Island and the second at the UBC camps. Uh, the second phase is supposed to be a performance created from those stories and uh, performed by the original storytellers of the first phase. The idea was to create a performance that besides a selection of the real stories of the participants involves many other events of uh, refugee crisis around the world, including the tragedy of uh, Alan Kurdi. But the pandemic happened and we were not able to continue our rehearsal for a few months. Then we have decided to arrange a meeting uh, to see what we can do. Um, by, during this meeting, by seeing all the uh, enthusiasm from everybody we have decided to continue seeing each other uh, virtually and think about a different strategy for the second phase uh, from my side i have uh, 
started to put some exercises together to practice with the participants. Then I asked everyone to unleash their imagination to create a storyline based on their experience, but not a total personal narrative. Uh, I asked them to unleash their imagination and let uh, bring uh, different ideas of uh, anything that comes to their mind. Uh, uh, starting individually, uh, each person was going to, to, to create something from their uh, story and uh, and from their imagination, something unreal, uh, I was calling. Uh, after that, we, we tried to connect connect them together. Two people work together. Uh, for one, one group was three people because we, we were seven. And make it the group three, three, two, and make it four, uh, two, and then work all together to create, uh, to, to connect all these ideas, all these stories, and make it uh, something that's, that, that wasn't, uh, I, I, I wasn't thinking about it at all. And I think no, no one in the group were thinking about it. So well, they come with great brilliant ideas. Uh, and now they have created a beautiful story that needs only a direction to have it uh, perform it to the public virtually. Uh, and uh, just to mention the final phase of uh, producing my home is a suitcase uh, is a full theatrical performance that involves uh, vocals, dance, uh, music. Uh, this phase uh, has a full script written by myself with uh, co-writing with Lenora Issy. Uh, we'll try to have it by next year. Uh, it depends on the funding process. Uh, thank you so much. I hope I didn't talk too much. Thank you for uh, for this opportunity. Thank you. And did we want to show a clip, Chris? Rasgar, did you want to show a clip? Uh, I think uh, it's with Chris, or I sent it to Chris. Yeah, I can show it now. Do you want me to show it now, Rasgar? Sure. It's up to you.
Thank you. Razgul, can you just clarify for us? So um, this clip that we just saw, is this based on work on this piece that you just uh, described to us? Uh, yeah, most of it is from the first phase, uh, which performed, I think most of the short videos is from uh, uh, UBC, the, the the day that we had performed at UBC. And uh, there are some other parts of uh, my previous uh, <laughs> Uh, production, which is called the Soldier Land, that was performed in 2018. Great, thank you. Okay, we're going to go to Scott, and then we'll have uh, some uh, discussion with all three of you. Hi, everybody. <laughs> <laughs> thank, thank you, Razgar, and thank you, Tetsuro. It was wonderful to hear about your pieces. Razgar, it sounds incredibly powerful and that trailer just makes me so excited to hear more and to and to and to see it and to see it and uh, Tetsuro, I saw one hour photo. I've actually seen one hour photo. I saw a workshop of it and I saw the production at the Kolch and now it's so interesting to see the cinematic adaptation and it's 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 so wonderful to see how it's grown and also to hear some of the images that still live within it and some of the the texture that is still alive within it um yes and i wanted to acknowledge um chris and george and sue and tetsuro and tal and everyone at the rbt collective uh i i love the rbt cohort i so appreciate its mission and i think it's it's it, it and i'm so grateful and privileged i feel so lucky to be part of the conversation today. Um, my name is Scott. I work in film, TV, theater as a writer, a creator, and an actor. Um, I live on the occupied, stolen lands of the Coast Salish people. And I grew up, uh, I'm a settler. I grew up in what in this, a suburb, colonially known as Langley, and um, it, which is home to the Kwantlen Nation, the Katsi Nation, Semiamu Nation, and the Matsui First Nations. And right now I'm on Oak Street, uh, Oak and 14th in colonially known as Vancouver. And across, Chris knows this, across the street from us, there is a, a building that is constantly doing yard work. And so if you hear blowing, mowing, raking, like that comes in halfway through, then we know who to blame for that. <laughs> For that and, and excuse me for that um yes and i also invite um if anyone wants to take a take a little breather during while i'm talking please just turn off your cam feel free turn off your camera don't don't feel like you have to look at me you know take a stretch it's all good um conserve your energy i know we're all spending a lot of time on zoom so chris before we dive in to the talk i'd love if you could share the trailer for night passing i'll tell a little bit before we share we hear the trailer night passing is a work of queer historical fiction it is inspired by the campaign by the rcmp to harass target and surveil queer canadians and this occurred from the late 1950s all the way to the early 1990s it was at its worst in the 50s and 60s before um, Prime Minister Trudeau Sr.'s um, kind of famous address of not being in the bedrooms of the nation. So it was at its worst in the late 50s and 60s and created a culture of paranoia and terror and uh, divisiveness. Um, but it also sowed the seeds of a lot of resistance that we see today. Um, and I'll get more into that. But Chris, do you want to play the trailer first? Never before had Canada seen anything like it. Overnight, a precarious minority government saw the electorate almost double. Night Passing is an entertaining, thought-provoking audio, audio play inspired by the true stories of LGBTQ Canadians who endured brutal harassment at the hands of their own government and the vital resistance that followed. We are in our war. Canada's first ballistic missile. A traditional family structure is the foundation of our country. To enjoy Night Passing, subscribe to Spotify and Apple Podcasts or visit artsclub.com to get the full audio
Thank you, Chris. Yes, Tal, it's true. There's nothing to see because it is an audio play, which makes it a little bit different from Tetsuro and Rausgar's project. And uh, it, it was, it's been interesting to work on. When I was thinking of what to present or what to talk about today, I, you know, I, I went back and forth, but I, I, I would like to share an excerpt from an essay I wrote when Night Passing was released uh, by the Arts Club Theatre Company um, last spring. And it's all available to stream. I will put the link, I'll put the link near the end um, that, that can link to the Spotify, Apple Podcasts, or the purchase link at the Arts Club. Um, anyway, I was, I was thinking of what to share and I wrote a essay that kind of captured all, all or at least most of my thoughts on the process of working on it. And I'd like to read an excerpt of that for you all. And it, it is, I am reading from an essay, so apologies if it sounds a little bit formal, <laughs> not as conversational or organic as Rasgar's and Tetsuro's. Uh, it's called To Future Nights, Notes on Night Passing. The present is not enough. It is impoverished and toxic for queers and other people who do not feel the privilege of majoritary, majoritarian belonging, normative tastes and rational expectations. The present must be known in relation to the alternative, alternative temporal and spatial maps provided by a perception of past and future effective worlds. That's a quote from Jose Esteban Munoz from Cruising Utopia, his remarkable book on queerness and ethics. And uh, you should just check it out. <laughs> Night Passing was originally conceived as a play for the stage, and it was nourished by funding from the BC Arts Council and the Emerging Playwrights Unit at the Arts Club. And I also adapted it into a television pilot script. And now it lives as an episodic narrative podcast. And it's been a fascinating journey because I think the story is really at home in the form of an audio drama. Audio drama is less prescriptive than theater and certainly less prescriptive than film and movies. It conjures images and story only with the enthusiastic consent of the listener. And as Tetsuro mentioned, there's always the dance of spectator and performer, and this is no less true in audio drama. And it really excites me to think of folks listening to it transported to the Ottawa of 1958 and hearing the world that Elliot is creating for you alone and casting you in the dual role of confidant and voyeur. I don't think that it's necessary to state the importance of excavating history. The importance of revisiting a history argument has often been used to justify art that damages. Shrouded in a sense of seriousness, a lot of works that in the past have been used to propagandize or rewrite historical accounts. The shameful Stonewall film, for instance, from 2015, portray portrays young white gay men being among the first ones to throw the first bricks in New York in 1969 at the Stonewall Bar. And we know that that's far from true. It was actually the queers of color, trans women, drag queens, who put themselves at the most severe risk of harm from the NYPD that, that night in 1969, and who continue to do so to this day. In fact, it was the white cis gays who were the first to turn away and distance themselves from extreme activists like Marsha P. Johnson and Sylvia Rivera. As a queer, white, cisgender male, I am the beneficiary to so many privileges that those activists fought for. And privilege, it works like an anesthetic. It makes you feel cozy and numb and forgetful. My hope with historically set work work that's steeped in research is that it can offer an antidote to that kind of forgetfulness, the forgetfulness that comes with privilege. Throughout working on Night Passing, I considered the baggage that all historically work, set work carries. There is a very much alive tradition of culturally dominant artists, white, cisgender, usually male, sometimes straight, these artists attach themselves to historical content centered around marginalized groups. And this isn't limited to the Hollywood movies, like the Stonewall film that I mentioned. This is endemic to many art forms. Dominant artists extract profit and prestige from such projects. And even more frequently, they use the lived or inherited histories of the non-dominated, non-dominant communities to inspire and diversify their own work. But Despite this baggage, something keeps bringing me and so many of us to work set in the past. History continues to fascinate, 
to revolt and to instruct us. And because of this, there will always be a yearning for work set before the immediate present. By tapping into nostalgia or animating an era that's distant to us, these stories touch us in ways that contemporary set work cannot. In addition to offering an antidote for, to forgetting, historical work can have a refracting quality. It enlarges our present selves and by looking to the past, we feel a pull to consider the future. When I was researching the RCMP's state mandated war against LGBTQ2S plus people, which lasted for decades, the era's bleakness made it tempting to craft a story that was loaded with trauma. But I think that that would be a shallow analysis of queer history. The 1950s were horrific for anyone who wasn't part of the dominant homogenous culture and queer people had a really difficult time. Outings, sodomy laws contributed to a life of rigid assimilation for even the most privileged gay people. Meanwhile, queers of color waged a two front war, the fight for their fundamental human rights, as well as a search for safe places to love each other. And for queers of color all over the world, particularly for trans and gender non-conforming folks, these battles are still being waged today. Yet during my research on the queer purge, I started to discover other truths, it, not one centered on brutality and self-betrayal, but stories of love, of naughtiness, of fun, of vitality and resistance. You know, these are also queer histories that mattered and they should also be remembered. In approaching such a loaded historical moment using genre as a framework made sense to me. As I um, hope you picked up on in, from the trailer, there's a kind of film noir aesthetic that sort of runs through Night Passing. And I think it really comes alive in the audio drama really beautifully in the sound design by Murray Price, uh, directed by Ashley Corcoran and with the wonderful actors that we had. You know, many of us know the tropes of film noir, the fashions, the shadows, the jazz, even if we don't have direct experience with the genre itself. In film noir, the characters are basically archetypes. They know who they are in the world. There's a sense of irony to them, to the femme fatale, to the corrupt cop. And this self-awareness actually kind of reminds me of the state of irony that queer people inhabit in straight society. Anyone who lives outside of the majority demonstrates this kind of social irony. It's an awareness of the performativity of what they do every day. Our daily life is often made up of a conscious choice to assimilate or to resist. And I just wanted to end today with sharing that I, I dedicate night passing to queers of the past and of the future. And as Jose Esteban Munoz argues in Queer Cruising Utopia, LGBTQ2S plus folks of right now must always have an eye both in front of us and behind us. Did the queers who loved and fought for our present selves and the ones who carry the torch to a more expansive future? Thank you. Neat. <clears throat> Thank you so much for the three of you. This was so interesting. And I've, even though there was three separate projects, I've, I've seen lots of um, co commonalities. So two of the projects dealt with displacement and all three of them dealt with othering, discrimination, justice issues. And those are such complex social issues that raise so much emotions and feelings and I'm, I guess my first question to you three is, I wonder if dealing with such complex issues made it harder to transition to the online format or maybe actually the online format provided some surprising opportunities dealing with those type of issues. So I don't know which one of you wants to start first, but just jump in. Um. I'll speak and I, I beg your pardon, folks. <laughs> I, it's part of my task here as part of the RBT Collective is to, uh, is, to, is to make a kind of secondary recording. So please forgive the presence of a camera yet again uh, <laughs> while I'm on screen. Um, for me, being able to revisit uh, one hour photo 
uh, in a different medium has been a real gift. Uh, back in 2017, when we first uh, had the world premiere of the theatrical version, we wanted to celebrate the life of a of a person who ex showed extraordinary resilience. But now that we're in 2021, uh, one of the deadly side effects of a pandemic has been the wave of anti-Asian violence that we're seeing all over the world. But uh, surprisingly, um, uh, Vancouver is considered the capital for anti-Asian uh, violence. Uh, that's something I read uh, in the, I believe, the Washington Post. And so for me, Mass's story is takes on a particularly uh, different um, resonance in that I think the violence that that Scott described against the uh, LGBTQ community, which has happened historically and of course continues to this day, and also the marginalization and the persecution of the Kurdish community that Razgar talked about, this is only possible when the dominant culture effectively dehumanizes a community. And I think with works like um, Razgar's and Scott's, what they help to do is to humanize the community. And so I think stories, theater in particular, is a really powerful antidote to this kind of uh, violence that is enacted upon marginalized people because such violence is only possible when those groups are seen as less than human. And I think, um, one of my students uh, in the class that uh, Chris and I teach together uh, pointed out that there is a social justice principle that says something to the effect of you cannot uh, hear someone's story without coming to love them. And I think that is a really powerful reminder of what it is that we do and, and why it continues to be of importance. Uh, so. Uh, I will now mute myself and press record. Yeah, uh, to, to echo, echo um, Tetsuro's words, yeah, it's interesting that the, the, the three pieces today speak to the presence um, of a dominant culture and the endemic nature of oppression. And to answer your question, Tal, I, I, I yeah, the it, shift, shifting work to online has been very interesting. Uh, it's been very uh, to to lead with the positives. Like I think online work during during the age of COVID, for all of its losses and all the, you know, the sadness that we feel at not being able to connect, there's been a lot of great steps forward in terms of access. Like in terms of folks with different. Uh, differently abled folks, you know, being able to access this work. Um, and, you know, pot, like it, for, for mine specifically, like an audio drama, um, we offer a transcription with it as well um, for to folks that want to, cited folks that want to read along. Um, that part is really, really exciting to me. And that's something that I don't want us to lose as we reopen um, to, to this sort of eye on access and this um, kind of more, inc the, the inclusivity that's come with that. Um, and then on an aesthetic level, I think considering Night Passing as an audio drama, I, I really love I really love it in that form because I think that there's, as I said, there's something so intimate about it, and it's such a collaborative form between the the speaker of the story and the listener. You really create it on your own, and and I think on an aesthetic and, and thematic level, um, it suits Night Passing really well. Like a lot of it is about secrecy, a lot of it is about mystery and the sort of that those sort of feelings um so it was it, it was a really interesting journey for sure uh, uh i think uh, the same for me uh i just want to uh, yesterday joe mentioned that the feeling of uh, uh transitioning uh theater into the screen that's uh i had the same thing i couldn't imagine and i didn't want to think about it actually uh, create uh, having the meeting with the participants it was 
like like uh, to pay back for their hard work and try to think about a few workshops and uh, some acting exercises with them but uh, seeing them doing this creative work together and uh, the, the and after i i saw uh, uh, some uh, performance online uh, i think I, I i i decided to to go with it it's uh, it's another way to connect with the, with the audience and uh, it's another way to to tell your story and uh, as the uh, uh, says to, to, to try to to be part of this connection between uh, between these stories and uh, the the general audience how to uh, uh, be part of this humanizing process thank you so i want to uh, rasgar you had um your project is unique in a sense that it included many few people uh Tatsura's work is um is a um, one single person plus the the story the person who you told their stories um and i'm not sure about scott whether it was um audio tape by one person or, or do you bring different voices but for you um this regard there's many people so i'm just wondering what kind of um and some of, and some of the participants in your project you also mentioned are the um, the refugees themselves so was there any specific challenges with regards to transitioning into online dealing with um many people some of them are refugees were there technical challenges were there ethical challenges that you that you dealt with throughout the project uh, uh, thank you uh, uh, for this uh, this question. Yeah, uh, I can say there are many challenges from the beginning of this process, even uh, be before thinking about uh, transition. Uh, I can say from the uh, interviews that I started in uh, Europe and uh, following this uh, these stories, uh, I I I. I uh, many challenges that i went through the major one is uh, i i think uh, uh, limitation of uh, of the budget which uh, somehow limited my capacity to 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 do what what what's possible to do with this project uh, other other challenges if i can uh, talk about it in general i think the most ethical challenges because uh, it's about the privacy of uh, of those who share their stories with you uh, uh, some of them they, they, they it's it's very sensitive because uh, it's not just about their their story it's sometimes it goes further about their refugee claims because uh, maybe they they pass by uh, a few countries until they got to a specific one, and that country doesn't allow anyone to 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 come from specific country. Anyways, these uh, these uh, storylines, uh, most of them supposed to be, it, it is uh, it's very uh, personal, and uh, I, I I could just use them for the sake of my research. Uh, otherwise, uh, there's no way I can I can talk about any any of those that's that's one of the challenges that i i had to uh to uh, uh, keep the uh, confidentiality of uh, of the uh, privacy of them uh, another part is uh, uh, going back to to tell these stories sometimes it's very traumatic so uh and the, from the beginning especially for the seven participants uh, be, uh, let's talk about this uh, uh we, we had to think about how to how to manage because sometimes during the exercises in the beginning we had to uh, let everyone to 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 share whatever they like in this uh, group exercise so sometimes they were they were going beyond 
what what is related to our subject and uh, sharing the different things so uh, how to how to manage this and i mo most of the time i i, I had to have uh, a counselor with me uh, during the rehearsals and during the exercises uh, to make sure that everything is under control and then uh, uh when 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 the pandemic starts and we, we start our meetings I, I i i was thinking about how challenging it could be for for them to to be alone in in a place and uh, to start uh, doing that but somehow uh, well, sharing the stories might help uh, to to heal from some of the pains and uh, traumas we might face but, but, but well, I can make sure uh, I, we uh, there were many many challenges in the whole process until now. Oh, thank you, and I'm I'm wondering um, if you can also think about opportunities that actually the transitioning to the online provided you because if, for example you mentioned the confidentiality and I'm just you know trying to brainstorm with myself about you know how can you how can you play with the fact that it's an online platform and allowing people who still want to, to stay anonymous participate like even only having voices I'm, I can think about a, a Alone in the Ring where we took advantage of the of the online platform for example where we had one of our participants who is a blind and sort of um, put masking on her uh, camera to give the audience the impression of ho how the world looks to her, like very fuzzy and, um, um, yeah, fuzzy is the best word. So blurry. So yeah, I'm wondering if there was any um, opportunities that you, that you saw in transitioning to the online platform. Uh, well, the, this, uh, well, the second phase of this project, which is, uh, uh, hopefully it's going to be online soon uh, is uh, the, it, uh, that that part of their stories that were shared in the uh, first space at the UBC and Granville Island uh, so these, these stories are okay they're okay to share the, everyone is okay to share the, this part of the life story and the, this one is uh, loaded with different uh, imagination, Im imagine, Im imagined, uh, imaginary uh, 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 events that they, they bring. Uh, some sometimes they they they, they bring events from uh, from real stories that published out there, and uh, uh, it's uh, mixed with uh, with other things that uh, that they they have created by themselves. Thank you. Tatsuro, I don't know if you want to talk a little bit about um, opportunities or advantages of using an online platform. I mean, Scott spoke, spoke a little bit about having it more accessible, um, but I don't know if Tatsuro, you have any thoughts about that. Yeah, um, and once again, I'll ask you to <laughs> excuse the, uh, the obtrusive equipment. Uh, I've, I was really lamenting the fact that I was unable to go on the usual uh, tour um, because that's perhaps my favorite thing in theater, but being able to uh, do the tour virtually has had a lot of advantages. Uh, in particular, uh, folks who I think would normally be disinclined to come to the theater um, are now be able, are able to see the show. Perhaps the most gratifying feedback I have received about uh, one hour photo in particular is, now I don't, think I'm a deeply skeptical person, but, and Scott and Razgar understand this ritual fairly well, after an opening night or after a show, it's considered just pro forma that, you know, people will come up to you after the show and, and, and say their niceties and congratulations. Uh, and I, for one, I'm always assuming, well, that's, this is just part of the theater ritual and they have to say that. Uh, not that I, think people are insincere, but some of the feedback I've, I've gotten as a result of, that's gotten back to me as a result of doing one hour photo is uh, folks who write to me and say that uh, when they sat down to watch the show in their living room, a son or a daughter or often a husband would come walking through the living room and they would pause for a moment 
uh, because they had no interest in catching a, 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 a particular show. Um, and they ended up staying to watch the entire show. And so it's inter and that of course would never happen within a real theater, uh, someone being inadvertently hooked in, into watching a show. And so to me, being able to come into people's living rooms or their homes, so to speak, is uh, a reminder to what degree theater is remains such an exclusionary art form. And now because we have so many theater practitioners, uh, you know, within our cohort, uh, within this cluster, it's easy to forget that. But it's an important reminder that a lot of folks continue to see theater the way, I don't know, we might see opera or attending the Bolshoi Ballet in Moscow, that it's a kind of rarefied uh, elitist atmosphere. So in that respect, I think lowering the barrier to entry uh, has been great. Also, just being able to have the freedom of inviting people to see the show no matter what city they're in. Uh, so often people who want to see a particular show will tell me, oh, by the time I, I learned about it, there was only a couple of days left. I couldn't get tickets. And then you were gone to the to another city. And so the evanescence of a theater run, which is only which is always so brief, uh, being able to be able to um, invite people to see it in another city has been Fantastic. So there are aspects to um, having theater uh, online that I really enjoy. And as uh, Joe Salvatore pointed out, I think during our first session, that the young Vic has decided going forward, they are going to continue to do live broadcasts of their shows in addition to their theatrical run. So I think... Um, there are things and innovations that have happened during this time of Zoom that uh, we're not going to give up. And I, for one, am, am happy about these additional affordances. Of course, I can't wait to get back in front of uh, an audience as well, but I'm also really excited about that uh, for all the innovations that have made theater a little bit more accessible and a little bit more egalitarian. Thank you. Um, I, I want to touch a little bit about what you said. So. Um, maybe if the three of you can focus about the experiences of both you as an artist and the audience. So I know for myself, when we perform the um, Alone in the Ring, I find it really, really difficult. No, and Tatur, you talked a little bit about it, not really uh, feeling the audience, you know, hearing them laugh when it's appropriate for them to laugh or, you know, s seeing their faces when things happen in, on, when, when we perform the, the show. Um, and at the same time, um, you also mentioned uh, to Tatura about uh, hearing some some audiences who told you that they felt a higher level of in, uh, in intimacy uh, seeing the play uh, over Zoom, and and I think we in, in Alone in the Ring also felt it like we we are we were evaluating the impact of the play, and we were fortunate enough to have Alone in the Ring both live and online so we were able to compare reactions of people from both those uh, genre and interestingly enough um people who watched alone in the ring in uh, over zoom uh, express higher uh, engagement in the play compared to those who watched it live so i'm just wondering if you have any any thoughts on the experiences of both yourself as an artist and the audience and your audience um as a result of transitioning to the online format. Oh, well, Tal, I, for one, I'm so encouraged to hear about uh, the intel you're sharing about Alone in the Ring and having a higher impact. That's really exciting to me. I, I met a young scholar from Toronto uh, at, at a conference, and he had a very interesting take on the way an audience perceives a show. He pointed out that for a performer, and Scott, I think Scott could relate to this, that the, in particular, because he's such a fine actor, uh, the performance for the actor begins long before the curtain rises. One warms up in the dressing room. I know when I'm on tour exactly four hours prior to showtime, for example, the show's at seven, at four, at uh, around 3 p.m., I have to start directing my thinking towards that night's performance. And so, whereas the uh, performance for the actor begins well beforehand, it can also end 
before the show is over. If you're on a home stretch, you might be you might start phoning it in and you might sort of have an out of body experience and think, where am I going to eat after the show? Conversely, uh, for the audience, the show doesn't begin um, sometimes until 10 minutes into the show. Think of Shakespeare in particular, Bart on the Beach. Despite having some of the best actors in the country, it takes a little bit of time to attune the human ear to iambic pentameter. And if you multiply that by worries about, oh, did I pay for parking? Oh my goodness, this babysitter is going to cost me so much. Sometimes people never get into the show and they just transition into having a nap. So I think part of the stresses of being within the theater is mitigated when you are at home. And so I think about um, some of those factors. And I remember one of the shows I had seen just prior to the pandemic. Uh, it was at the Vancouver Playhouse. And I remember the person in front of me was coughing to such a degree, I, I thought this patron would cough up a lung. And this, this was before COVID. But myself and my companions found this a little bit stressful, uh, you know, part empathy, part irritation. But uh, so again, that was yet another environment in which I think our engagement with the theater show was in fact attenuated by being there live. And I think sometimes if you are able to really sort of sit down with a glass of wine in the comfort of your own home and watch a particular show, then yeah, I think I can under, I can, I'm beginning to understand why in some ways that can be uh, an even uh, a superior experience. So I'm excited to learn about uh, your own experiences uh, there, Tal. So thank you for sharing that with us. Scott, do you want to respond to that anyway? Absolutely. Yeah, it, 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 there's been mention of the opening night feeling and um, it's very interesting not having that uh, in an audio drama context because as, a, as an actor, I, 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 I did, I'm not in night passing. Um, it's it's more just me as a writer but as an actor for opening nights i always love them because it's such an adrenaline rush it's so fun and you know you go out and you party um but opening night experiences for me as a playwright are pretty horrendous i'm very neurotic uh i it's very it's it's not a good scene at all for, for me chris has seen it um and it, it's just awful and but so with the audio drama it was kind of really lovely to short circuit all of those neuroses and all of the kind of like sitting in the back with my arms folded looking miserable because the the you know the episodes came out week by week they were released week by week by the arts club people had the option of purchasing the whole thing um on the first day and then it was kind of just out in the world and like it was a very you know it was also in the midst of the pandemic so just had a very soft start and it felt uh it felt very peaceful it, at the same time, then on, on the flip side, it's similar to what you were saying, Tal, about the experience of being on Zoom. And I think the experience all of us have on Zoom, even in work settings, uh, which is that it can it can be challenging and very draining because you're not getting that kind of person-to-person -person feedback. So I do, uh, of course, I miss that person-to-person -person feedback, but the audio drama form is 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 really fun. I, I also like the idea of it being more on-demand than something, than, than theater. The thrill of theater is that you kind of, sit on a, you you strap in and you start going up the hill of the roller coaster and you're going to be on the roller coaster till the end unless you have to leave the, the theater whereas an audio drama i kind of like the on-demand thing of you know you like i'll take like a podcast out and i'll go for a walk and i'll listen to 10 minutes and it's like nah i'm not really into this and then you turn it off and then and then you go back the next day and listen to three episodes all in a row while you're walking or cooking or something um so I, yeah, I think that there's there's really interesting kind of dynamics when it comes to all all of the options. Thank you. Erasmo, do you want to add anything or? Uh, no, actually, I would like to wait until we have the show. <laughs> okay. Okay. So my last question before I I move on to all of you out there in the in this space. I don't want to dominate it. Is I'm wondering how have your experience working in this online context transformed your practices as theater artists? Do you know, maybe you don't know it yet, but if you do know, then. 
did, did, did it change anything you think you're going to do from now on? Yeah, uh, I think one of the most exciting aspects for me is the realization that uh, I can collaborate with artists who are not in Vancouver. And that's been that's been really tremendous. Uh, theater, by very definition, by its very definition, tends to be such a hyper local phenomenon. And now that people are collaborating across time zones and doing it effectively, uh, that in particular has probably been the, the biggest um, epiphany that I've had. And I'm really looking forward to seeing the, the work that will come out of that because uh, that's something that's happening right now in terms of my own practice. Yeah, that's a really wonderful way of saying it, Tetsuro. I completely agree in, in the kind of leveling of the play of playing field. We've seen it in terms of access um, for patrons. And now we're seeing it also in terms of the, the degree of collaboration, the extent of collaboration. So I really, really love that. Um, and, and then I, I, for my experience of adapting to an online, specifically to an audio drama, it I adapted Night Passing now into three different forms. And so it was, it's been really fascinating to see kind of what comes from that, you know, and now as I embark on new projects, the kind of the the opportunities and the sort of offerings that happen um, when you adapt it to a different medium, uh, I'm going to be watching out for those and, and hopefully learning from those moving forward. Thank you. Raz, got anything from your end or should we move to the other questions? Okay, so uh, thank you, the three of you. So uh, I see Kyle have his hand up, so I'll open it to Kyle and then I see there is one question in the chat that I'll will follow. So. Cool, thank you. I'll uh, just start with a comment. I know a couple of years ago, I heard about um, the theory of audiencing so, um, you know, of course, being a performer on stage has lots, uh, you know, lots of challenges and lots of, you know, adjustments that we have to make when we go online. But I really actually grew fond into this discussion, just this idea of audiencing. And I'll just tell a very quick story of uh, going to see uh, Django, Django Unchained in a movie theater years and years ago. And there was only like four people in the movie theater, one of which was this guy who's just really into the movie and he was yelling out at the screen. And uh, when Leonardo DiCaprio showed up, he was like, oh, Leonardo. And I just thought it was hilarious, but you know, didn't disrupt the movie that much. I just thought this guy was really enjoying. And then, of course, at the end of the performance were the uh, other two patrons that were complaining to the Usher saying, you know, this person ruined this experience of theater. But then, of course, now that I've had a whole year of, well, it's been like six months of no movie theaters open at all, I really miss that. And that's something that, like, you know, I'd love to go in. So when Tetsuro mentioned about, like, you know, being in a show and having the person behind you coughing, it's really strange that when you're just denied that access, you miss it. Or, like, you know, that's the thing, that's the thing about audiences there. Uh, always, um, like get to what, the roller coaster ride. I know that was Scott, right? Uh, getting on that roller coaster and just, you know, what can happen next. That's the fun part about being in the theater. So I think there are ways that we can incorporate that in Zoom meetings and doing online theater. Uh, but, anyways, I just think, you know, maybe if that's a discussion point, the audience thing for, uh, you know, all those people out there in little rectangles, how are we connecting with them? I'll just leave that as a question. Thank you. I don't know if anyone wants to reflect on that or. Okay. Um, uh, Kevin, do you want to ask the questions out loud or do you want me to read it out? You can unmute yourself and ask it or I can read it out, no problem.
clear it out. Okay. So <clears throat> Kevin, <clears throat> Kevin right? if we believe in the term history repeating, the question becomes, what is what is it that is being passed on to, to later generation? Or in other words, what is it that is not being passed on to later generation? It seems that demand may be more important for the rate of occupations, injustices, inequity, than the supply of good practices. Perhaps research-based theater has an opportunity to investigate both the demand and supply side. Any thought from? The panel, or I don't know, maybe George wants to jump in, or anyone else. I've been reflecting on that question, Kayvon, <laughs> um, but I, but I, I don't really have a, a response. But I, I think it's 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 one of those rhetorical questions of of, of thinking about it, and what, maybe what yeah, what is the role of RBT? Is that sometimes theater has the permission to be a little more disruptive. Um, all the, I think the three, certainly um, because Razgar is still in process, but certainly Scott and Tetsuro's plays um, are disruptive. I think they push people into uncomfortable zones. Um, they ask hard questions. Um, they don't give any answers. So, um, so yeah, so I think I think Kayman, you're right that the the theater in general and, and perhaps RBT, especially with some of our goals that are around trying to address marginalized communities, like our, our pillars are really about um, hopefully making a difference and but opening conversations. So maybe I'll, I'll leave it at that. And um yeah, I think yeah, I'll use here also. I don't know if Yale wants to talk about it because in the Lord of the Ring, um we do bring the occupation of the injustices, but we also try to, um, at the end of the of the piece, to direct it into the what you what you call the supply, the best practices or some advice that we might have for 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 the audience. Um, and I think this is I, I see this um, the unique side of RBT actually in the sense that because it's based on research, in research and it's in it's it's there not just well, well, much of the RBT, not all RBT, but it, it's not just a theoretical piece for the culture of it. Um, you're trying to convey um, findings from a research that you've done in a way that will have an impact. Then our piece, at least, the Alone in the Ring comes together, not just with the piece itself, but it comes also with some um, flyers that we created that provide some advice and a suggestion for people for, for better, for best practices. So. I don't, I don't know if that taps into your question, uh, Kayvan, but. Um... Yeah, it's a it's a really interesting idea, though. It's a um, and Tal, what you were saying about what for for Alone in the Ring, um, the kind of process of sort of leaving the audience with the sort of actionable items or in, in the more in the in, in a healing kind of gesture. Um, that's sort of why it was it was important to me to in writing night passing like like i said it, it it's there's so much trauma in queer history uh there's there's so much pain there's so much heartbreak and violence um and i feel like that's those those narratives have been centered so much in queer stories that we've heard um over the 20th century and i think there's a growing movement um to create new queer work by really really fascinating queer artists um, that don't center trauma as much. And so that's why it was interesting um, and vital for me to really explore, like, like even using the genre kind of, of, of film noir, the metaphors of film noir and a, a, inviting that sense of play to the audience, a sense of playfulness and also including love and romance and, and sexuality and all the excitement that comes from discovering who you are and, and finding yourself, um, those things, um, were really, really valuable to me because I didn't want someone, especially, you know, like a young queer person to hear it and be further traumatized or further hurt by it. Um, and to kind of end in this sort of gesture of, of healing or, you know, or taking action or, and, and, and celebration as well. Yeah, listening to you, Scott, it makes me realize your own commentary about um, not always situating the narrative of a community around trauma. It reminds me of 
Kim Harvey's own um, desires to to push up against the stereotype of indigenous plays always being about, in her words, uh, dying and crying, and why she wanted Kamlupa in particular to be about indigenous joy. And I think that is such an important, um, I think, pattern that I'm detecting in, in, in both of your works, uh, because perhaps in the longer view of things, perhaps the grammar of emancipation is such that the first wave of stories that are accepted, perhaps even with re resistance or begrudgingly into the mainstream, are those um, serve a kind of function in terms of uh, enabling the sort of uh, white mainstream or heterosexual psyche to, to engage in a kind of uh, sacrament of self-flagellation. Uh, uh, so maybe it's, it's serving that purpose. But once, as you say, Scott, we refuse to participate in those roles, maybe then and only then we can begin focusing on stories of laughter and love. And for me, for, for One Hour Photo, that's why, uh, for those of you who haven't seen the show, Mass has a really remarkable love story that begins in the incarceration camp and extends out through over the course of his lifetime, which is really unconventional and surprising. And so for me, that was such an essential element because I think you're exactly right. Sometimes the risk in describing trauma is that we can um, actually traumatize people um, once again. So I think having that balance uh, overall is a really important cultural turn that we're beginning to witness. Absolutely, Tetsuro. I, I I completely agree, and you know, it's in the in the theater tradition. We're all, I won't speak for everyone here, but I I feel I was trained in a very Eurocentric institution in Eurocentric institutions that um, you know triumph and celebrate plays that are or organized around um, co notions of creating conflict, of tension, uh, and kind of maximizing pain for the protagonist. And I and I'm loving this this new this new gesture of like actually stories are a lot more than about pain. There can be pain and tension and 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 you know you you can be engaged, but the, stories can also be about healing. They can be about ritual. They can be about celebration, about laughter, about joy and and fun and yes yes. Just echoing exactly what you said, Tetsuro. <laughs> yeah, and, and I'm really glad we're having this conversation, Scott, because something that I see again and again from my students, I, I teach playwriting, is in particular from mar from people who belong to marginalized communities, is that for so many young people, and I would include myself during my early career, our imaginations have been so colonized by the existing tropes of mainstream culture, which of course is inherently sexist, racist, and, and homophobic, and, um, and rife with ableism, what have you. And so I think a, an important question to ask ourselves, which I present to students, is what is the book, what is the play, what is the movie, what is the novel that you wish to see in the world that you would like to read? Because I think part of what behooves us as creative people is to create the very stories, or to write the very stories that we needed to hear um, during a particular stage in our own life or in the present. And so I think that's often a really good starting point in if what we need are in fact stories of, of love and joy and giving that experience because sometimes being in, a sh uh, in the theater or watching a show online, sometimes that is such a valuable respite uh, from the microaggressions that people uh, experience uh, in their daily life. Thank you. Um, we have a question for you, uh, Razgar. Um, where is it? 
Uh, Taylor asks, uh, who is the intended audience of your piece? The family members of the storytellers and actors, other refugees, settler can Canadians? Mm, uh, the audience are general public. It's not specific for, for any community or uh, any group. Um, I want to go back to, uh, uh, to the previous uh, conversation about uh, uh, for my home is a suitcase. The first uh, phase that we had two performers on uh, live. Uh, for, for both of them, we had two uh, counselors sitting there and uh, uh, observing uh, the, uh, the event. And uh, we informed, uh, informed the audience that there's, if you feel uh, uh, anything you can just uh, con uh, go to them and uh, uh, for for this uh, phase or the online one that we are working on uh, it's different it's not that uh, hard uh, on the audience it's uh, it's totally different it's it's performance uh, with, uh, music dance uh, this part of the stories in different way that we did in the first phase so it's it's totally different. Yeah, that, that's that's a good point. That we also um, in Lord of the Ring, it's something we constantly think about uh, triggering and how we support audience. Um, so definitely taking um, care of that. Are there any more questions from the audience? I have a few more, but if anyone wants to jump in and unmute himself or put, paste it in the chat, we can go ahead. Uh, until anyone does it, I, so, um, I have a question. Uh, um, so what would the three of you want to pass on to the research-based theater uh, practitioners who are exploring online theater for the first time? Is there any important lessons that you want us to know about, pay attention to? I, I think that I, I, wanted, I would invite us to op open up the kind of possibilities of what theater can be online. I can't um, hear Scott for some reason, it's only me. Hello. Yeah, I can, I can hear Scott. I can hear Scott too. Sorry, Tal. Um, I, I think I think I would I would challenge challenge us to kind of re to challenge our ideas of what theater online is. Yeah. You know, but you know beyond beyond something that's on Zoom or beyond uh, something that's purely audio, like heavily produced audio or something, that, that it can take so many different so many different forms. Um, you know, like personal correspondence or like, or like a one-on-one -on -one kind of phone call, like, like all these kind of very intimate forms um, can work, can translate really well online. And it doesn't need to be, it doesn't need to just be visual. It doesn't need to just be audio. It can be, you know, communicated by email. There's all, all sorts of possibilities. Yeah, I think one of the most exciting things about doing research-based theater and pivoting to online is that now the barrier to entry has been lowered uh, a great deal. You know, I've heard it said that the true measure of your, of how appropriate or how well suited you are rather to your vocation is how you feel about the drudgery that's involved. And pre-pandemic, I spent probably 95 percent of my time as a theater artist, raising funds, uh, writing grants, uh, meeting sponsors, um, individual or corporate, because to do one of my shows, it takes an enormous amount of money. Like people are shocked to hear how much one of my shows, I'm shocked. And so, whereas for my next iteration of, of, of Empire of the Sun, which I'll be doing for my own home, I'm going to be able to do that for if my grants don't come through, I can still go ahead with that show. And I think what was so exciting about seeing George's piece, Brothers, uh, and, and Jenny's piece, Enthroned, which she had made in collaboration with Joe, uh, they really show 
what is possible when you are confronted by limitations and the kind of ingenious creativity that arises when you're using what is at hand. And so I think, uh, as Jenny mentioned in our opening session, it really returns us to a kind of, uh, to, to the essential uh, nature of theater. You know, one of my favorite passages from Peter Brooks, um, The Empty Space, is how he describes a peak theater experience for him, which was not being on Broadway, which was not seeing a gigantic chandelier crash or a huge helicopter being lowered from, from the grid. But he was in an attic um, s somewhere in Eastern Europe and uh, a young man sat down on a chair and he said, my name is Nikolai. The year is 1771. And that's, that is the very essence of theater. And it seems to me that the restrictions of COVID and, and being online is a terrific reminder of paring things down to the very essential. And so for me as an artist, I, I feel like, uh, again, uh, something that um, Jenny mentioned in our opening uh, session, that we can be invited to return to a beginner's uh, mindset, which I think is so valuable. And how many times within your lifetime can do you find yourself as a creative person at the very beginning of an emerging art form? And I think that's one of the most exciting things. And so I would encourage anyone who's interested in doing RBT, we are on the threshold of a new era aesthetically and the playbook hasn't been written. There are no rules. And so I think that's incredibly exciting. And what Lon and Graham presented yesterday, I think is just a really tantalizing glimpse of the kind of creativity that is possible uh, within these, uh, within this frame. Thanks. I, I, I agree. Erasmo, did you want to add anything? Uh, well, I just want to say that uh, we, we might all have uh, different visions and uh, different way to, to do theater. For me, uh, doing it online is still is not uh, very clear. Uh, I, I don't think I'll be satisfied by uh, by doing this all my life. <laughs> uh, I, 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 this is like a temporary for me. But uh, the, to, to to find a style uh, to to think about doing theater for for the sake of as uh, uh, I always go with uh, uh, Arthur's. Uh, Impact how to how to have the real impact on the audience, but, but we but sharing the stories is one of, 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 of the, this way for that for my home is a suitcase. The first phase is it's just the first phase. We are not pairing the audience. We we but we think we we need to to, to really have uh, impact on them. That's that's what uh, how I think about it, and I I I still not sure that. Uh, doing it online, this this way, it, uh, how how it's gonna be until I, I see the results of it. Yeah, thanks. Interesting. So we have different perspectives among us. Um, Lynn posed a question. Do you, Lynn, do you want to ask it out loud, or do you want me to read it out? Uh, I can ask it. So I, I this is just fascinating conversation, and I want to thank the three of you for this and you're going to the very heart of how do we hold, create and hold a space where you invite audience as witness, as listeners to arrive. And, you know, audience will listen, they will receive, they will accept, they will reject, they will turn away, they will awaken, and there will be wounding, right? That there's a reciprocal wounding that happens every time theater arrives in our midst. Um, so how do, how do we care for those who carry an invisible backpack that each of us does because, because in the language that so often is used, um, the individual has disappeared. The individual experience and story has disappeared. And um, how do we sit in that difficulty, as Julie Salperson would say, and how do we care for each other without wounding, re-wounding.
I mean, I, I, I'm curious to hear what your own answer to that might be. It's such an amazing question. Um, the one thing I can offer is one of the distinctions I've noticed between doing live theater and, and this form of theater is that uh, I always make a point of coming out immediately after a show uh, in order to be able to speak with audience members, those who want to linger uh, in, in the lobby. But there's something about being on stage above everyone that is a kind of alienating transfiguration. Um, whereas I found that in these types of spaces, when I'm engaged more directly um, and I put things into the chat or there's that kind of live interaction, I am just often kind of one square among many. And I've noticed that my rate of interaction with people who will text me, write to me or email me has increased exponentially. And so I'll have these sort of short term correspondences with folks who want to share their own memory or talk about things. I think the fundamental question you're asking is how do we perceive that invisible backpack, which I think is such a, a wonderful question and such a wonderful challenge. And I think we've all experienced that looking into the eyes of someone in the audience and knowing that something is going on there, but not being able to continue beyond that. I think that is perhaps uh, an enduring uh, barrier, but I think there is some, something uh, a little bit more, uh, less intimidating uh, and more egalitarian. If, for example, if the movie star on the screen is fr from another in dimension entirely, and if the live performer on stage is a kind of demigod, then I feel like, hmm the performances that are enacted one-on-one uh, -on -one through Zoom actually kind of lowers the performer in, in the best possible way in and amongst the so-called groundlings. And so in that respect, I do hope that there will be increased opportunities for being able to hold space for, as you so beautifully described, for those who were unintentionally wounded. But I'd love to hear your own insights as well. Then, and, and, and I just, before, I, I just to add, I it's a great question, and I and I wonder often whether this is the difference between again for me, like I'm keep thinking about it, the research-based theater and theater, where I think with research-based theater we are more, well, at least I feel more responsible for the content that I'm delivering and for the audience that is in the um, is present because we often also target specific audiences that we want to impact them. And we always make sure that we are present and we are there for discussions um, to 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 unpack those unpacked uh, uh, backpacks. Definitely, yeah. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Well, I think what's exciting about research-based theater is that you can create, right, and hold a space for each other. Um, and I think of the of the piece as the catalyst to engage and to invite story. Because very much to Soro, it's sitting on the chair and sharing your story and listening to another story that we begin uh, to be present to and with each other and hold each other's, um, not only wounding, but as Scott says, the celebrations. And um, so how do we create these spaces to encounter each other? And I think that's the gift of uh, research-based theater. Um, so that... Yeah. I was just going to say so that so that it begins, it doesn't end right even with the talk back. It begins with that or ends with the inquiry that arises and the generosity of those um, receiving and offering. I just want to add to that, Lynn, because I think that was posed yesterday in one of the sessions, just so for those of you who are aware, what you know, where's the spectrum of theater and research based theater? And one of the answers is that they're part of one another. Um, but I, but I think what, what um, today's speakers also talked about the, the notion of transformation and, um, and, and so many, so many other things. And Rasgar took us to a place where he gave the backstory of why he's doing the play. Um, uh, Scott did that as well as did Tetsuro. So I think what research based theater, one of the components 
um, is it's a three act structure. And actually, um, Julie, I take your point too. the structures are colonial in their own way. So we'll have to maybe think about a different three act uh, word than three act structure. But if, mm -hmm. um, if you can just uh, go with me with this one, the first one, act one is, is really about setting up the audience because it's not necessarily a theater audience. It's, it's giving what Tal says, the what, what are the goals of the research and what it might be. And then, so, and that's an important part. It should be really, I think, curated. Uh, Jenica is not here today, but Jenica would really um, say that you, you're looking at how you might assess it. Everything happens in that act one. It's really setting up the, um, the, 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 the performance. And then the performance or the piece, the sharing is the second one. And we should pay attention to that. And then the third one is what Tal is also mentioning is that discussion afterwards and is what we're doing here. And all three should have equal um, commitment and uh, preparation. But those of us who have worked in the theater quite often, we focus so much on that second one, just getting uh, about the performance itself, which is important, but we need in research-based theater to spend time on how do we set up the space? How do we invite people in the space? And then the third one, how do we facilitate a discussion that's going to move the needle forward on whatever the particular agenda. And if I could just jump in, George, um, discussion feedback. I'm thinking of indigenous ways of one performs and then someone in the audience or several in the audience will rise and offer something in response and as in thanks. And uh, so there, there's something about the language that we might think about as we, um, as we uh, circle. <laughs> Circle yeah. the space you've created, all of you, so beautifully. Thank you. Thank you. I, um, we have three minutes left. So at first, I want to remind you that we have the gem board. So please uh, log in. Uh, Chris put it in the chat. So feel free to log in and uh, write your reflections or questions or comments. We are going to use all those at the end uh, in our last session on Friday to have a broader discussion. Um, there are two more questions in the chat, but I don't know if we have the time for those. So um, Chris and George, should we just say final thoughts by the, by the panel or, yeah. Okay, so I don't know if any of the panel members have any final thoughts about our discussion today, anything that's left lingering that they wanna share with us before we say goodbye. Thank you very much for having me. This was a lovely experience. That's all. <laughs> yes, thanks for putting this all together. It was a real pleasure. I enjoyed it immensely. And thank you for uh, the quality of everyone's attention. Same here. Thank you. Uh, it was a great opportunity for me to, to uh, meet all of you again and uh, hope to see you after now. <laughs> thank you. And uh, for those who asked the question and we didn't have a chance to respond to them, we will collect those questions and maybe we'll, we'll be able to address those in our session on Friday. Just a quick plug. So to get access to Night Passing, the links are in the chat. You can go to the Arts Club website or Spotify. Tetsuro, can people get tickets from the upcoming tour of One Hour Photo on your website? Uh, yes, but uh, it'll be simpler for them to... Uh, um, yeah, I will put that... For anyone who's interested, I will put that into the, into the chat uh, imminently. Uh, and then they can they can uh, see the show, uh, get tickets from East West players. But they can Excellent. yeah they can visit my website as well, shiggy.com. Okay, and Razgar, will people can people go to Sky Theater your web your theater company's website to learn more about how they can see my home is a suitcase when when we're ready for that. Uh, yeah, sure. Uh, I, I, I try to put it uh, out there. It's uh, it's very simple. Sky Theater Group uh, dot com. <laughs> it's already in the chat, so yeah. so people have access to that now. Yeah. And just a reminder, everyone, we're back at two p.m. for our next session this afternoon. Uh, I just want to uh, mention that uh, at Sky Theater we have another production coming up. It's big. Uh, it's also about uh, five uh, women. It's called Phantom Pain, uh, written and directed by Lenora Isi, and uh, that's going to be hopefully from July 20th to 25th. We're going to put it on the website. 
Thanks so much for sharing that, Varaskar. Thank you, Tao, for facilitating this session as well, and to all our speakers this morning. And the Jamboard is going to be still active and open, so during lunch, if you have time, do that. Thank you, everyone. See you later in the afternoon. Tao. Thanks, everyone. Thank you. Take care. Thank you. <laughs>